Hello and welcome back to Classic Books of Little Star with Jamie, Lily, Chloe, and Bella, who is still making her way. She's doing a lot better though. But today we're going to get back to Stephen King's Pet Cemetery. And as always, please stay safe, healthy, hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, and the notification bell. And here we go. Okay, we're starting off today at chapter 23, and it's a short one, but we'll go further. He awoke at nine the next morning. Bright sunshine streamed in the bedroom's east window. The telephone was ringing. Lewis reached up and snared it. Hello. Hi, Rachel said. Did I wake you up? Hope so. You woke me up, you bitch, he said, smiling. Oh, such nasty language. You bad old Barry, she said. I tried to call you last night. Were you over at Judd's? He hesitated for only the tiniest fraction of a moment. Yes, he said. Had a few beers. Norma was at some sort of Thanksgiving supper. I thought about giving you a ring, but, you know. They chatted a while. Rachel updated him on her family. Something he could have done without, although he took a small, mean satisfaction in the news that her father's bald spot seemed to be expanding at a faster rate. You want to talk to Gage, Rachel asked. Lewis grinned. Yeah, I guess so, he said. Don't let him have, hang up the phone like he did the other time. Much rattling at the other end. Dimly, he heard Rachel cajoling the kid to say, Hi, Daddy. At last, G Gage said, Hi, Daddy. Hi, Gage. Lewis said cheerfully. How are you doing? How's your life? Did you pull over your grandpa's pipe rack again? I certainly hope so. Maybe this time you can trash his stamp collection as well. Gage babbled on happily for 30 seconds or so interspersing his gobbles and grunts with a few recognizable words from his growing vocabulary. Mommy, Ellie, Granda, Grandma, Car, pronounced in the best Yankee tradition as Ka, Lewis was amused to note, truck and shit. At last, Rachel pried the phone away from him to gauge his wail of indignation and Lewis's measured relief. He loved his son and missed him like mad, but holding a conversation with a new with a not-quite-two-year-old, was like trying to play cribbage with a lunatic. The cards kept going everywhere, and sometimes you found yourself pegging backwards. So how's everyone, th everything there, Rachel asked. Okay, Lewis said, with no hesitation at all this time. But he was aware he had crossed the line. Back when Rachel had asked him if he had gone over to Judd's last night, and he told her he had, in his mind he suddenly heard Judd Crandall saying, The soil of a man's heart is stonier, Lewis. A man grows what he can, and he tends it. Well, a little dull if you want to know that God's honest, but miss you. You actually mean to tell me you're not enjoying your vacation from the sideshow? Oh, I like the quiet, he admitted. Sure, but it gets strange after the first 24 hours or so. Can I talk to Daddy? It was Ellie in the background. Lewis, Ellie's here. Okay, put her on. He talked to Ellie for about five, almost five minutes. She prattled on about the old grandma, about the doll grandma had gotten her, about the trip she and Granda da had taken to the stockyards. Boy, do they stink, Daddy, Ellie said, and Lewis thought, your grand does no rose either, sweetie, but how she had helped make bread and about how Gage had gotten away from Rachel while she was changing him. Gage had run down the hallway and pooped right in the doorway leading into grand da's study. Attaboy, Gage, Lewis thought, a big grin spreading over his face. He actually thought he was going to get away, at least for this morning, and was getting ready to ask Ellie for her mother again so he could say goodbye to her when Ellie asked, How's church, Daddy? Does he miss me? The grin faded from Lewis's mouth. But he answered readily and with a perfect note of offhanded casualness. He's fine, I guess. I gave him the leftover beef stew last night and then put him out. Haven't seen him this morning, but I just woke up. Oh, boy, you would have made a great murderer and cool as a cucumber, Dr. Creed. When did you last see the deceased? He came in for supper. Had a plate of beef stew, in fact. I haven't seen him since then. Well, give him a kiss for me. Yuck, kiss your own cat, Lewis said, and Ellie giggled. You want to talk to Mommy again, Daddy? Sure, put her on. Then it was over. He talked to Rachel for another couple of minutes. The subject of church was not touched upon. He and his wife exchanged love views, and Lewis hung up. That's that, <clears throat> he said to the empty sunny room. 
maybe the worst thing about it was that he didn't feel bad, didn't feel guilty at all. It's end of chapter 23, on to 24. Steve Masterton called around 9.30 and asked if Lewis would like to come up to the university and play some racquetball. The place was deserted, he said gleefully, and they could play the whole goddamn day if they wanted to. <clears throat> Lewis could understand the glee when the university was in session. The waiting for, list for ra a racquetball court was sometimes two days long, but he declined all the same, telling Steve he wanted to work on an article he was writing for the magazine of college medicine. You sure? Steve asked. All work and no play. Made Jack a dull boy, you know. That sounds like come from the shining. Check me later, Lewis said. Maybe I'll be up for it. Steve said he would. Said he wouldn't hung up. Lewis had, had told only a half lie this time. He did plan to work on his article, which concerned itself with treating contagious ailments such as chicken pox and mononucleosis <coughs> in the infirmary environment. But the main reason he had turned down Steve's offer was that he was a mass of aches and pains. He discovered this as soon as he finished talking to Rachel and went into the bathroom to brush his teeth. His back muscles creaked and groaned. His shoulders were sore from lugging the cat in the damned <coughs> in that damned garbage bag. And the hamstrings and back of his knees felt like guitar strings tuned three octaves past their normal pitch. Christ, he thought, and you had the stupid idea you were in some kind of shape. He would have looked cute trying to play racquetball with Steve, lumbering around like an arthritic old man. And speaking of old men, he hadn't made the hike into the woods that night by four by himself. He had gone with a guy who was closing in on 85. He wondered if Judd was hurting as badly as he was this morning. He spent an hour and a half working on his article, but it did not march very well. The emptiness and the silence began to get on his nerves, and at last he stacked his legal, yellow legal pads and the offerings he had ordered from John Hopkins on the shelf above his typewriter, put on his parker across the road. Judd and Norma weren't there, but there was an envelope tacked to the porch with his name written across the front of it. He took it down and opened the flap with his thumb. Lewis, the good wife and me are off to Bucksport to do some shopping and look at a Welsh dresser at the Emporium Glorium that Norma's had her... <coughs> Eye on for about a hundred years, it would seems like. Probably we'll have a spot of lunch at McLeod's. McLeod's. They really have at McLeod's in uh, Bucksport, too. I got a picture of it for you when we go again. In fact, also, we're right down from, from the Mount Hope Cemetery. I have some pictures I'll put on for you. I get some more of them. While we were there, and come, came, come back in the late afternoon, come on over for a beer or two tonight if you want. Your family is your family. I don't want to be no Budinsky. But if Ellie were my daughter, I wouldn't rush to tell her that her cat got killed in, on the highway. Why not let her enjoy her holly, holiday? By the way, Lewis, I wouldn't talk about what we did last night either. Not around Norma Ludlow. Excuse me, not around North Ludlow. There are other people who know about the old Micmac burying ground. And there are other people in town who have buried their animals there there. You might say it's another part of the cemetery, pet cemetery. Believe it or not, there's even a bull buried up there. Old Zach McGovern, who used to live out in Stackpole, on Stackpole Road, buried his prize bull, Hanratty, in the Micmac burying ground back in 1967 or 68. Haha. -ha. He told me that he and his two boys had taken that bull out there, and I, and I laughed until I thought I would rupture myself, but people around here don't like to talk about it, and they don't like people they consider to be outsiders to know about it. Not because some of the old super, these super old superstitions go back 300 years or more, although they do, but because they sort of believe in these super, those superstitions, and they think any outsider who knows that they do must be laughing at them. Does that make any sense? I suspect it doesn't, but Nevertheless, that's how it is. So just do me a favor and keep that shut on the subject, will you? We will talk more about this probably tonight, and by then you will understand more. But in the meantime, I want to tell you that you did yourself proud. I know you would. I knew you would. Judd. P.S. Norma doesn't know what this note says. I told her something different, and I would just as soon keep it th that way 
if it's all the same to you. I've told Norma more than one lie in the 58 years we've been married, and I'd guess that most men tell their wives the smart of lies, but, you know, most of them could stand before God and confess them without dropping their eyes from his. Well, drop over tonight, and we'll do a little boozing, Jay. Lewis stood on the top step, leading the judge in Norma's porch, now bare and comfortable red, rotten furniture stored to wait for another spring, frowning over this note. Don't tell Ellie the cat, cat had been killed. He hadn't. Other animals buried there. Superstitious, go, superstitions going back 300 years. And by then you'll understand more. He touched this line lightly with his finger and for the first time allowed his mind to deliberately turn back to what they had done the night before. It was blurred in his memory. It had the melting cotton candy texture of dreams or of waking actions performed under a light haze of drugs. He could recall climbing the dead ball and the odd, brighter quality of light in the bog that and the way it had, had felt 10 or 20 degrees warmer there. But all of it was like the conversation you had with the anesthetist, anesthetist just before he, was, he or she put you out like a light. And I'd guess most men tell their wives the smart of lies. <laughs> men. Wives and daughters as well, Lewis thought, but it was eerie. The way Judd seemed almost to know what had transpired this morning, both on the telephone and in his own head. Slowly he refolded the note, which had been written on a sheet of lined paper like that in a schoolboy's blue horse ta tablet, and put it back into the envelope. He put the envelope into his hip pocket, crossed the road, and we're on to chapter 25. 25. It was around one o'clock that afternoon when church came back with the cat in the nursery rhyme. Very next day, we thought he was a goner. But the cat came back the very next day. Lewis was in the garage where he had been working off and on for the last six weeks on a fairly ambitious set of shelves. He wanted to put all of the dangerous garage stuff such as bottles of windshield wiper fluid, antifreeze, and sharp tools on, on these shelves where they would be out of gauges reach. He was hammering in a nail when Church strolled in, his tail high. <laughs> Lewis, <laughs> that's curiosity, I believe. Lewis did not drop the hammer, even slam his thumb. His hard jog in his chest, but did not leap. A hot wire seemed to glow momentarily in his stomach. And then cool immediately like the filament of a light bulb that glows over brightly for a moment and then burns out. It was as if he told himself later he had spent that entire sunny post-Thanksgiving Friday morning, waiting for church to come back, as if he had known in some deeper, more primitive part of his mind what their night hike up to the Micmac burying ground had meant all along. He put the hammer down carefully, spat the nails he had been holding in his mouth back into his palm, and then dumped them into the pockets of his workman's apron. He wanted to. He went to church and picked the cat up. Live weight, he thought, with a kind of sick excitement. He weighs what he did before he was hit. This is live weight. He was heavier in the bag. He was heavier when he was dead. His heart took a bigger jog this time, almost a leap, and for a moment the garage seemed to swim in front of his eyes. Church laid his ears back and allowed himself to be held. Lewis carried him out into the sunlight and sat down on the back steps. The cat tried to get down then, but Lewis stroked him and held him on his lap. His heart seemed to be taking regular jogs now. He probably... He, he, excuse me, he probed gently into the heavy ruff of fur at Church's neck, remembering the sick, boneless way Church's head had swiveled on his broken neck the night before. He felt nothing now but good muscle and tendon. He held Church up and looked at the cat's muzzle closely. What he saw there caused him to drop the cat under the grass quickly and to cover his face with one hand, his eyes shut. The whole world was swimming now, and his head was full of a tottery, sick vertigo. It was the sort of feeling he could remember from the bitter end of long drunks, just before the, just before the puking started. There was a dried, there was dried blood caked on Church's muzzle and caught in his long whiskers with two tiny shreds of green plastic, bits of hefty bag. We'll talk more about this, and by then you'll understand more. Oh, Christ, he understood more than he wanted to write now. Give me a chance. Lewis thought, and I'll understand myself right into the nearest mental asylum. He let Church into the house, got to his blue dish, and opened a tuna and liver cat dinner. 
As he spooned the gray-brown mess out of the can, Lewis, excuse me, Church purred unevenly and rubbed back and forth along Lewis's ankles. The feel of the cat caused Lewis to break out in goose flesh. He had to clench his teeth grimly to keep from kicking him away. His furry sides felt somehow too slick, to, too slick, too thick, and a word, loathsome. Lewis found he didn't care if he ever touched Church again. When he bent and put the dish on the floor, Church streaked past him to get, get it, and Lewis could have sworn he smelled sour earth as if it had been ground into the cat's fur. fur. He stood back, watching the cat eat. He could hear him smacking. Had Church smacked over his food that way before? Perhaps he had, and Lewis had just never noticed. Either way, it was a disgusting sound. Gross, Ellie would have said. Abruptly, Lewis turned and went upstairs. He started at a walk, but by the time he got to the upper hallway, he was almost running. He undressed, tossing all of his clothes in the laundry hamper, although he had put them on fresh from the underwear out that morning. He drew himself a hot bath, as hot as he could take it, and plopped in. The stream rose around him, and he could feel the hot water working on his muscles, loosening, loosening them. Loosening them, that is. <laughs> The bath was also working on his head, loosening that. By the time the water had begun to cool, he was feeling dozy and pretty much all right again. The cat came back just like the cat in the nursery room, all right. So what big deal? And so the cat came back the very next day. He thought he was gone, but the my mother used to sing that one. Or just... It had been all a mistake, hadn't he thought to himself yesterday evening that church looked remarkably whole and unmarked for an animal that had been struck by a car? Think of all the woodchucks and cats and dogs you seen strewn all over the highways, he thought. Their bodies burst, their guts everywhere, technical or loudin as Loudon Wainwright says on the record about the dead skunk. It was obvious now Church had been struck hard and stunned. The car car he had carried up to Judge Old Micmac burying ground had been unconscious, not dead. The cat he had carried up to Judge Old Mick Mac burying ground had been conscious, not dead. Didn't they say cats had nine lives? Thank God he hadn't said anything to Ellie. She wouldn't ever have to know how close church had come. The blood on his mouth and rough, the way his neck turned. But he was a doctor, not a vet. He had made a misdiagnosis, that was all. He had hardly been under the best circumstances for close examination, squatting on John's lawn in 20 degree temperatures. The light almost gone from the sky, and he had been wearing gloves. That could have. A bloated, misshapen shadow rose on the tiled bathroom wall like the head of a small dragon or some monstrous snake. Something touched his bare shoulder lightly and skidded. Lewis jerked, almost, excuse me, jerked upward galvanically, splashing water out of the tub and soaking the bath mat. He turned, cringing back at the same time and stared into the muddy yellow-green eyes of his daughter's cat who was perched on the lowered seat of the toilet. Church was swaying slowly back and forth as if drunk. Lewis watched his body crawling with revulsion, a scream barely held back in his mouth by his clamped teeth. Church had never looked like this, had never swayed like a snake trying to hypnotize its prey, not before he was fixed and not afterward. For the first and last time, he played with the idea that this was a different cat, one that had just looked like Ellie's. The cat that had wandered into his garage while he was putting up those shelves, and that the real church was still buried under that carn on the bluff in the woods. But the markings were the same, and the one ragged ear, and the paw that it had bunny, that had that funny chewed look. Elliot slammed that paw in the back door of her, their little suburban house when church was little more than a kitten. It was church, all right. Get out of here, Lewis whispered hoarsely at him. Church stared at him a moment longer. God, his eyes were different. Somehow they were different, and then leapt down from the toilet seat. He landed with none of the uncanny grace cats usually display. He staggered awkwardly, haunches thudding against the tub, and then he was gone. It, Lewis thought. Not he, it. Remember, it's been fixed. He got out of the tub and dried off quickly, jerkily, sh shaved and monthly, and mostly dressed when the phone rang, shrill in the empty house. When it sounded, Lewis whirled, eyes wide, hands going up. He lowered them slowly. His heart was racing. His muscles felt full of adrenaline. With Steve Masterton checking back about racquetball, and Lewis agreed to meet him at the Memorial Gym in an hour. He could not have really for the time. And racquetball was the last thing in the world he felt like right now, but he had to get out. 
He wanted to get away from the cat, that weird cat which had no business being there at all. He hurried, tucking in his shirt quickly, stuffing a pair of shorts, a shirt, t-shirt, and a towel into a zipper bag and trotting down the chair, stairs. Church was lying on the fourth riser from the bottom. Lewis tripped over the cat and almost fell. He managed to grab the banister and barely save himself from what could have been a nasty fall. He stared. He stood at the bottom of the stairs, breathing in snatches, his heart racing, the adrenaline whipping unpleasantly through his body. Church stood up, stretched, and seemed to grin at him. Lewis left. He should have put the cat out. He knew that, but he didn't. At that particular moment, he didn't think he could bring himself to touch it. And we're on chapter 26. Chapter 26. Judd lit a cigarette with a wooden kitchen match, shook it out, and tossed the stub into a tin ashtray with a barely readable Jim Beam advertisement painted on its bottom. Aya, it was Stanley Bouchard who told me about the place, he paused, thinking. Barely touched glasses of beer stood before them on the checked oilcloth that covered the kitchen table. Behind them, the barrel of range oil clamped to the wall, gurgled three times deliberately, and was still. Lewis had caught a pickup supper with Steve, submarine sandwiches and the mostly deserted beer's den. I think we even have a bear's den, too. Oh, no, that's not Poland. Eh, whatever. He had found out early that if you asked for a hoagie or a grinder or a gyro in Maine, they didn't know what you were talking about. Ask for a sub or a Watt burger and you were in business. Now, I've never heard of Watt burger. We call them Italian sandwiches. I've heard in Portland we always call them Italian sandwiches. With some food on him, Lewis began to feel better about... In him, Lewis began to feel better about Church's return. Felt that he had things more in perspective. But he was still not anxious to return to his dark, empty house where the cat could be. Let it, let's face it, gang, anywhere at all. Norma sat with them for quite a while, watching TV and working on a, on a sample that showed the sun going down behind a small county meeting house. The cross on the roof tree was silhouetted black against the sun's setting sun. Something to sell, she said, at the church sale the week before Christmas. Always a big event. Her fingers moved well, pushing the needle through the cloth, pulling it through the steel circle. Her arthritis was barely noticeable tonight. Lewis supposed it might be the weather, which had been cold but very dry. She had recovered nicely from her heart attack. And on that evening, less than ten weeks before a cerebral accident would kill her, he thought that she looked less haggard and actually younger. And that evening he could see the girl she had been born. She had been. At a quarter to ten, she said good night, and now he sat here with Judd, who had ceased speaking and seemed only to be following his cigarette smoke up and up like a kid watching a barber's pole to see where the stripes go. Stanny B. Lewis prompted gently. Judd plinked and seemed to come back to herself, himself. Oh, yeah, I said, everyone in Ludlow, round bucks, put in prospect. And Orrington, too, I guess. Just called him Sandy B. That year, that year my dog Spot died. 1910, I mean, the first time he died. Stanny was already an old man and more than a little crazy. There were <coughs> others around these parts that knew the McBack burying ground was there, but it was Stanny B. I heard it from, and he knew about it from his father before him. Whole family of proper Canucks, they were. Judd laughed and sipped his beer. I can still hear him talking in that broken English of his. He found me sitting behind the very, behind the li livery stable that used to stand on Route 15, except it was just the Bangor Bucksport Road back then. <clears throat> right about where the wrinkle plan is now. Spot wasn't dead, but he was going. My dad sent me away to check on some chicken feed, which old Yorkie sold back then. We didn't need chicken feed any more than a cow needs a blackboard, and I know well knew well enough why he sent me down there. He was going to kill the dog. He knew how tenderly I felt about Spot, so he sent me away while he did it. I saw about the chicken feed and while old Yorkie set it out for me. I was around back and sat down <clears throat> on the old grindstone that used to be there and just bawled. Judd shook his head, his head slowly and gently, still smiling a little. And long comes old Stanny B. He said half the people in town thought he was soft, and the other half thought he might be dangerous. His grandfather was a big fur trapper and trader in the early 1800s. Stanny's granddad would go all the way from the Maritimes to Bangor and Derry, sometimes as far south as Skowhegan, to buy pelts, or so I've heard. He drove a big wagon covered with rawhide strips like something out of a medicine show. 
He had crosses all over it, for he was a proper Christian who preached on the resurrection when he was drunk enough. <clears throat> this is what Stanley said. He loved to talk about his granddad, but he had pagan, in pagan Indian signs all over it as well, because he believed that all Indians, no matter what the tribe, belonged to one big tribe. That lost one of Israel the Bible talks about. He said he believed all Indians were hellbound. Bullshit, obviously. But that their magic worked because they were Christians all the same, in some queer, damned way. Stanley's granddad bought from the Micmacs and did a good business with them long after most of the other trappers and traders had given up or gone west because he traded with them at a fair price and because Stanley said he knew the, the whole Bible by heart and that and the Micmacs liked to hear him speak the words the black robes had spoken to them in the years before the buckskin men and woodsmen came. He fell silent. Lewis waited. The Micmacs told Stanny B's granddad about the burying ground, which they didn't use anymore because the wendigo had soured the ground, and about little god swamp and the steps and all the rest. The wendigo story now, that was something you could hear in those days all over the North Country. It was a story that had to have the same... Excuse me, it was a story they had to have, the same way I guess we have to have some of our Christian stories. No one would damn me for a profaner if she heard me say that, but Lewis, it's true. Sometimes if the winter was long and hard and the food was short, there were North Country Indians who would finally get down to the bed, bad place where it, was, where it would starve or do something else. Cannibalism? Judge shrugged. Maybe. Maybe they'd pick up someone who was old and used up, and then there would be stew for a while. <laughs> And the story they worked out would be that the Wendigo had walked through their village or encampment while they were sleeping and touched them. And the Wendigo was supposed to give those it touched a taste for the flesh of their own kind. Lewis nodded, saying the devil made them do it. Sure, my own guess is that the Micmacs around here had to do it at some point and that they buried the bones of whoever they ate, one or two, maybe even ten or a dozen, up there in their burying ground. And then decided the ground had gone sour, Lewis muttered. So his Stanny B come out and back of the library to get his jug, I guess. Judd said, already half crocked he was. His grandfather was worth maybe a million dollars when he died or so, people said. And Stanny B was nothing but the local ragman. He asked me what was wrong, and I told him. He saw I'd been bawling, and he told me there was a way it could be fixed up if I was brave. And sure, I wanted it fixed up. I said I'd give anything to have Spot well again. <clears throat> and I asked him if he knew a vet that could do it. Don't know no vet me, Stanny B said. But I know how to fix your dog, boy. You go home now and tell your dad to put that dog in a grain sack, but you ain't gonna bury him. No, you got you're gonna drag him up to the pet cemetery and you're gonna put him in the shade by that big dead ball. Then you're gonna come back and say it's done. I asked him what good that would be, and Stanley told me to stay awake that night and come out when he threw a stone against my window. And it be midnight, boy, so if you forget oh, I went too far. And so if you forget, Stanny B, and go to sleep, Stanny B, gonna forget you, and it's good goodbye dog, let him go straight to hell. Judd looked at Lewis and lit another cigarette. It went just the way Stanny B set it up, Stanny set it up. When I got back, my dad said he'd put a bullet in Spot's head to spare him any more suffering. I didn't even have to say anything about the pet cemetery. My dad asked if I didn't think Spot would want to bury me. Didn't think Spot would want me to bury him up there, and I said I guessed that he would. So off I went, dragging my dog in a grain sack. My dog, dad asked me if I wanted help, and I said no, being because I remembered what Stanley B said. I laid awake that night. Forever seemed like, you know how com time is for kids. It would seem to me I must have stayed awake right around until morning, and then the clock would only chime 10 or 11. A couple of times I almost nodded off, but each time I snapped wide awake again. It was almost as if someone had shaken me and said, Wake up, Judd, wake up, like something one <coughs> make sure I stayed awake. Lewis raised his eyebrows at that and Judd shrugged. When the clock in the downstairs hall chimed twelve, I got right up and sat there dressed on my bed, with the moon shining in the window. Next I know the clock is a chime in the half hour, then one o'clock, and still no Stanny B. He's forgot all about me, that dumb Frenchman, I think to myself, and I'm getting ready to take my clothes off again when these two pebbles whap off the window damn near hard enough to break glass. One of them did put a crack in the pane, but I never noticed it until the next morning. My mother didn't see it until the next winter, but then she thought the frost done it. I just about flew across to that window and heaved it up. It grated and rumbled against the wind frame. 
the way they only seem to do when you're a kid and you want to get out, go, get out after midnight. Lewis laughed, even though he could not remember ever having wanted to get out of the house some dark hour when he was a boy of ten. Still, if he had wanted to, he was sure that windows, which had never creaked in the daytime, would creak then. I figured my folks must have thought burglars were trying to break in, but when my heart quieted down, I could hear my dad still sawing wood in the bedroom on the first floor. I looked out, <coughs> and there was Danny B standing in the driveway and looking up, swaying like there was a high wind when there was, wasn't so much as a puff of breeze. I don't think he ever would have come, Lewis, except that he'd gotten to that stage of drunkenness where you're as wide awake as an owl with diarrhea and you just don't give a care about anything. And he sorts of yells up at me, only I guess he thought he was whispering. You coming down, boy, or am I coming up to get you? Shh, I said, scared to death now that my fa dad will wake up and give me the whopping of my young life. What'd you say, Stan? He says even louder than before. It's my parents had been around on that roadside of the hut, this house, Lewis. I would have been a goner, but they had the bedroom that belongs to Norma and me now with, with the river view. I bet you got down th those stairs in one hell of a hurry, Lewis said. Have you got another beard, Judd? He was already too past his usual limit. But tonight that seemed okay. Tonight that seemed almost mandatory. I do. You know where they are kept, Judd said, and lit a fresh smoke. He waited until Lewis was seated again. No, I wouldn't have dared to try the stairs. They went past my parents' bedroom. Went past, I went down the ivy trellis, hand over hand, just as quick as I could. I was some scared, I was some scared, I can tell you, but I think I was more scared of my dad than just, than that, then, than I was of going up to the pet cemetery with Stanny B. He crushed out his smoke. We went up there, the two of us, and I guess Stanny B must have fallen down half a dozen times if he fell down once. He was really far gone, smelled like he'd fallen to a vat of corn. One time he damn near put a stick to his throat, but he had a pick and shovel with him. When we got to the pet cemetery, I kind of expected he'd sling me the pick and shovel and just pass out while I dug the hole. Said he seemed to sober up a little. He told me he was going on up over the dead ball and deeper into the woods where there was another burial place. I looked at Stanny, who was so drunk he could barely keep his feet. And I looked at that dead ball and said, you can't climb that, Stanny B. You'll break your neck. And he said, I ain't going to break my neck. Me, and neither are you. I can walk and you can lug your dog. And he was right. He sailed up over that dead ball just as smooth as silk, never even looking down. And I looked, lugged Spot all the way up there, although he must have weighed 35 pounds or so, and I only went about 90 myself. I wanted to tell you, though, Lewis, I was some sore and sprung the next day. How did you feel today? Lewis didn't answer, only nodded. We walked and we walked, Judd said. It seemed to me we was going to walk forever. The woods were spookier in those days. More birds calling from the trees, and you didn't know what any of them was. Animals moving around out there, deer most likely. But back then there were moose too, and bears and catamounts. I dragged Spot. After a while I started to get that funny idea that old Stanny B was gone and I was following an Indian. Following an Indian, and somewhere farther along, he'd turn around, all grinning and black-eyed, his face streaked up with that stinking paint they made from beer fat, and that he'd have a Tommy Hawk made out of a wedge of slate and a hake of ashwood all tied together with rawhide. And he'd grab me by the back of the neck and whack off my hair, along with the top of my skull. Stanley wasn't staggering or falling anymore. He just walked straight and easy with his head up. That sort of helped to feed the idea. But when we got to the edge of the little god swamp, and he turned to talk to me, I, saw, I seen it was Stanny all right, and the reason he wasn't staggering or falling anymore was because he was scared. Scared himself sober, he did. He told me the same things I told you last night about the loons and the St. Elmo's fire and how I wasn't to take any notice of anything I saw or heard. Most of all, he said, don't speak to anything if it should speak to you. Then we started across the swamp, and I did see something. I ain't going to tell you what, only that I've been up there maybe five times since that time when I was ten. I've never seen anything like it again. Nor will I, Lewis, because my trip to the Micmac burial place last night was my last trip. I'm not sitting here believing all of this, am I? Lewis asked himself almost conversationally. The three bears' beers helped, me, helped him to sound conversational, at least to his own mind's ear. I'm not sitting here believing this sort of old Frenchman and Indian burial grounds and something called the Wendigo and pets that came back to life, am I? 
For Christ's sake, the cat was stunned. That's all. A car hit it and stunned it. No big deal. This is a senile old man's maunderings. Except that it wasn't, and Lewis knew it wasn't. And three beers wasn't going to cure that knowing, and thirty-three beers wouldn't. Church had been dead. That was one thing. He was alive now, and that was another. There was something fundamentally different, fundamentally wrong about him, and that was a third. Something had happened. Judge, Judd had repaid what he saw as a favor, but the medicine available at the Micmac burying ground was perhaps not such good medicine. And Lewis now saw something in Judd's eye that told him the old man knew it. Lewis thought of what he had seen, or thought he had seen, in Judd's eyes the night before. That capering, gleeful thing. He remembered thinking that Judd's decision to take Lewis and Ellie's cat on that particular night journey had not entirely been Judd's own. If not his, then his, then whose, his mind asked, and because he had no answer, Lewis swept the uncomfortable question away. I buried Spot and built the car, and Judd went on flatly, and by the time I was done, Stanny B was fast asleep. I'd shake the hell out of him to get him going again, but by the time we got down those 44 stairs, 45, Lewis murmured. Judd nodded, yeah, that's right, ain't it, 45. By the time we got down those 45 stairs, he was walking as steady as if he was sober again. We went back through the swamp and the woods and over the dead ball, and, fi and finally we crossed the road, and we was at my house again. It seemed to me like ten hours must have gone past, but it was still full dark. What happens now, I asked Stanny B. Now you wait and see what it may happen, Stanny says, and off he walks, staggering and lurching again. I imagine he slept out in the back of the library that night, and as things turned out, my dog Spot outlet lived Stanny B. by two years. His liver went bad and poisoned him. And two little kids found him on the road on July 4th, 1912, stiff as a poker. But me, that night, I just climbed back up the ivy and got into bed and fell asleep almost as soon as my head touched the pillow. Next morning, I didn't go get up at, until almost 9 o'clock and then my mother was calling me. My dad worked on the railroad and he would have been gone since 6. Judd paused, thinking, My mother wasn't just calling me, Louis. She was screaming for me. Judd went to the fridge, got himself a Miller's, and opened it on the drawer handle below the bread box and toaster. His face looked yellow in the overhead light, the color of nicotine. He drained half his beer out of the belts like a gunshot, and then glanced down the hall towards the room where Norma slept. He looked back at Lewis. This is hard for me to talk about, he said. I turned it over in my mind years and years, but I've never told anyone about it. Others knew what had happened, but they never talked to me about it. The way it is about sex, I guess I'm telling you, Lewis, because you've got a different kind of pet now. Not necessarily a dangerous one, but different. Do you find that's true? Lewis thought of church, jumping awkwardly off the toilet seat, his haunches thudding against the side of the tub. He thought of those muddy eyes that was almost that were almost but not quite stupid, staring into his own. At last he nodded. Hey, Chloe. When I go downstairs my mother was backed into a corner in the pantry because twin ice box and one of the counters. There was a bunch of white stuff on the excuse me, floor, curtain she'd been meaning to hang. Standing in the doorway of the pantry was Spot, my dog. There was dirt all over him and mud splashed clear up to his legs. Oh, <laughs> she wants out. The fur on his b belly was filthy, all knotted and snarled. He was standing there, not growling or nothing, just standing there. But it was pretty clear that he had backed her into a corner, whether he meant to or not. She was in terror, Lewis. I don't know how you felt about your parents, but I know how I felt about mine. I loved them both dearly, knowing I'd done something to put my own mother in terror. It took away any joy I might have felt when I saw Spot standing there. I didn't even seem to feel surprised that he was there. I know the feeling, Lewis said. When I saw Church this morning, it just, I just, it seemed like something that was, he paused a moment, perfectly natural. Those were the words that came immediately to mind, but they were not the right words, like something that was meant. Yes, Judd said. He lit a fresh cigarette. His hands were shaking the smallest bit, and my mother seen me there, still in my underwear, and she screamed at me, Feed your dog, Judd. Your dog needs to be fed. Get him out of here before he messes the curtains. So I found him some scraps and called him, and at first he didn't come at first. It was like he didn't know his own name, and I almost thought, well, this ain't Spot at all. It's some stray that... Looks like Spot, that's all. Yes, Lewis exclaimed. Judd nodded. But the second or third time I called him, he came. He was sort of jerked towards me, and when I let him out onto the porch, damned if he didn't run into the side of the door and just about fall over. He ate the scraps, though. 
just wolf them down. But then I was over my first fright and was starting to get an idea of what had happened. I got on my knees and hugged him. I was so glad to see him. Then he licked my face and Judd shuddered and finished his beer. Lewis, his tongue was cold. Being licked by Spot was like getting rubbed up the side of your face with a dead carp. For a moment, neither of them spoke. Then Lewis said, go on. He ate, and when he was done, I got an old tub. We kept him out from under the back porch, and I gave him a bath. Spot always hated to have a bath. Usually it took me and my dad to do it. And we'd end up with our shirts off and our pants soaked, and my dad cussing and Spot looking sort of ashamed, the way dogs do. And more likely than not, he'd roll around in the dirt right after and then go over by my mother's clothesline to shake off and put dirt all over the sheets he, she'd hung and she'd scream at both of us that she was going to shoot that dog for a stranger before she got much older. But that day, D Spot just sat in the tub and let me wash him. He never moved at all. I didn't like it. It was like, like washing meat. I got an old piece of towel after I gave him his bath and dried him all off. I could see the places where the barbed wire had hooked him. There was no fur in any of those places. And the flesh looked dimpled in. It is the way an old wound looked after it's been healed for five years and more. Lewis nodded. In his line of work, he had seen such things from time to time. The wound never seemed to fill in completely, and that made him think of graves and his days as an undertaker's apprentice, and how there was never enough dirt to fill in, fill them in again. Then I saw his head. There was another of those dimples there, but the fur had grown back, white in a little circle. It was near his ear. Well, your father shot him, Lewis said. Judd nodded. Shooting a man or an animal in the head isn't as sure fire as it sounds, Judd. There are would-be suicides in vegetable woods, or even walking around right as rain, who didn't know that a bullet can strike the skull plate and travel around it in a semicircle, exiting the other side without ever penetrating the brain. I personally saw one case where a fellow shot himself above the right ear and died because the bullet went around his head and tore open his jugular vein on the other side of his head. That bullet path looked like a country road map. Judd smiled and nodded. I remember trading, reading something like that in one of Norma's newspapers, The Star or The Inquirer, one of those. But if my pop said Spot was gone, Lewis, he was gone. All right, Lewis said. If you say that's how it was, that is how it was. Was your daughter's cat gone? I sure thought it was, Lewis said. You got to better, to do better than that. You're a doctor. You make it sound like you got to do better than that, Lewis. You're a god. It, I'm not god. It was dark. Sure, it was dark, and his head swiveled on his neck like it was full of ball bearings. And when he moved him, he pulled out of the frost. Some, it was sounded like a piece of sticky tape coming off a letter. Live things don't do that. You only stop melting the frost under where you're laying when you're dead. In the other room, the clock struck 10.30. What did your father say when he came home and saw the dog, Lewis asked? I was on the driveway shooting marbles in the dirt, more or less waiting for him. Felt like I always felt when I done something wrong and knew I was probably going to get his spanking. He came in through the gate post about 8 o'clock, wearing his bib overalls and his pillow tick cap. You ever see one of those? Lewis nodded, then stifled the yawn with the back of his hand. Yeah, I'm getting late, Judd said. Gotta finish this up. It's not that late, Lewis said. I'm just a few beers ahead of my usual pace. Go on, Judd. Take your time. I want to hear this. My dad had an old lard tin. He kept his dinner in, Judd said, and he came in through the gate swinging it. Empty by the handle, you know. Whistling something. It was getting dark. But he's seen at me there in the gloom and he says, Hi there, Judkins, like he would do. And then, where's your... He got that bar and then here comes Spa out of the dark. Not running like he usually did, ready to jump all over him. He was so glad to see him. But just walking, wagging his tail. My dad dropped that lard bucket and stepped back. I don't know but what he would have turned tail and run except his back hit the picket fence and then he just stood there looking at the dog and when he spot did jump up dad just caught his paws and held him like you might hold a lady's hand she was going getting ready to dance with he looked at the dog for a long time but then he looked at me and he said he needs a bath judd he stinks of the ground you buried him in and then he went in the house what did you do lewis asked gave him another bath he just sat there in the tub and took it again and when i went in the house my mother had gone to bed even though it wasn't even nine o'clock, my dad said, we got to talk, Judkins. And I sat down, sat down across from him, him and he talked to me like a man for the first time. 
in my life with the smell of the honeysuckle coming across the road from what's your house now and the smell of the wild roses from our house, own house, Judd Crandall sighed. I had always thought it would be good to have him talk to me that way, but it wasn't. It wasn't a bit good. All this tonight, Lewis, it's like when you look into a mirror that's been set up right across from another mirror and you can see yourself going down a whole hall of mirrors. How many times has this story been passed along, I wonder? A story that's just the same except for the names. And that's like the sex thing, too, isn't it? Your dad knew all about it? Yeah, yeah. Who took you up there, Judd, he asked me. Told him. He just nodded like it was what he would have expected. I guess it probably was. Although I found out later that there was six or eight people in Ludlow at that time that could have taken me up there. I guess he knew that Stanny B was the only one crazy enough to have actually done it. Did you ask him why he didn't take you, Judd? I did, Judd said. Somewhere during that long talk, I did ask him, and he said it was a bad place by and large, and it didn't often do often do anything good for people who had lost their animals or for the animals themselves. He asked me if I'd like to spot the way he was, and do you know, Lewis, I had the hardest time answering that, and said, important that I tell you my feelings on that, because sooner or later you're going to ask me why I led you up there with your daughter's cat. It was a bad thing to do, isn't that so? Lewis nodded. What was Ellie going to think about church when she, she got back? That had been much on his mind while he and Steve Masterton had been playing racquetball that afternoon. Maybe I did it because kids need to know that sometimes dead is better, Judd said without some difficulty. That something your Ellie didn't, that's something your Ellie didn't know, and I got a feeling that maybe she didn't know because your wife d don't know. Now you go ahead and tell me if I'm wrong and we'll leave it. Lewis opened his mouth and then closed again. Judd went on, now speaking very slowly, appearing, sorry, honey, appearing to move from wor wor word to word as they had moved from hummock to hummock in Little God's Swamp the night before. I've seen it happen over the years, he said. I guess I told you that Lester Morgan buried his prized bull up there. Black Angus named Hanratty. Ain't that a silly name for a bull? Died of some sort of ulcer inside. And Lester dragged him all the way up there on a sledge. How he did it? How we got over the dead well that I d there, I don't know. But it's said that you, that what you d want to do, you can. And at least as far as that burying ground goes, I'd say it's true. Well, Hanratty came back, but Lester shot him dead two weeks later. That bill bull turned mean, really mean. But it's the only animal I ever heard of that did. Most of them just seem a little stupid, a little slow, a little, a little dead. Yeah, Judge, a little dead, like they had been somewhere and came back, but not all the way. Now, your daughter isn't going to know that, Lewis. Not that her cat was hit and by a car and killed and come, came back. So you could say you can't teach a child a lesson unless the child knows there's a lesson to be learned. Except, except sometimes you can, Lewis said, more to himself than Judd, to Judd. Judd, yes, Judd agreed. Sometimes you can. Maybe she'll learn something about what death really is, which is where the pain stops and good memories begin. Not the end of life, but the end of pain. You don't tell her those things. She, she will figure them out on her own. And if she's anything like me, she'll go on loving her pet. It won't turn vicious or bite or anything like that. She'll go on loving it, but she'll draw her own conclusion, conclusions and she'll breathe a sigh of relief when it finally dies. That's why you took me up there, Lewis said. He felt better now. He had an explanation. It was diffuse. It relied more upon the logic of the nerve endings than the logic of the rational mind, but under the circumstances, he found he could accept that. And it meant he could forget that expression. The expression he thought he had seen on Judd's face briefly last night. That dark, capering gl glee. Okay, that's... Abruptly, almost shockingly, Judd covered his face with both hands. For one moment, Lewis thought he had been struck by a sudden pain, and he had half-rose, concerned as he saw the convulsive heave of the chest and realized that the old man was struggling not to cry. That's why, but it ain't why, he said in a strangled, choked voice. I did it for the same reason Stanny B. did it, and for the same reason... Lester Morgan did it. Lester took Linda Levesque up there after her dog got run a, run over there and got got uh, after her dog got run over in the road. He took her up there even though he had to put his goddamn bull out of its misery for chasing kids through its pasture like it was mad. He did it anyway. He did it anyway. Lewis said. Judd almost moaned. And what the Christ you make of that? Judd, what are you talking about? Lewis asked, alarmed. 
Lester did it, and Stanny did it for the same reason I did it. You did it because it gets hold of you. You did it because that burial place is a secret place, and you want to share the secret. And when you find a reason that seems good enough, why? Judd took, took his hands away from his face and looked at Lewis with eyes that seemed incredibly ancient, incredibly haggard. Why, then, you just go ahead and do it. You make up reasons. They seem like good reasons, but mostly you do it because you want to. <coughs> because you have to. My da my daddy didn't take me up there because he's heard about it, but he... He'd heard about it, but he'd never been. Stanny B. had been up there, and he took me, and 70 years ago, by and then, all at once. Judd shook his head and coughed dryly into the palm of his hand. Listen, he said. Listen, Lewis. Lester's bull was the only damn animal I ever knew that really turned really mean. I believe that Missy Levesque, Mrs. Levesque's little child might have been bit, might have bit the postman once after, and I heard of a few other... Things, animals that got a little nasty, but Spot was always a good dog. He always smelled like dirt. Didn't matter how many times you washed him, he always smelled like dirt, but he was a good dog. My mother would never touch him afterward, but he was a good dog just the same. But Lewis, if you was to take your cat out tonight and kill it, I would never say a word. That place, all at once, it gets a hold of you, and you make up the sweetest smelling reasons in the world, but I could have been wrong, Lewis. That's all I'm saying. Lester could have been wrong. Stanny B could have been wrong. Hell, I ain't God either. By bringing the dead back to life, that's about as close to playing God as you can get, ain't it? Lewis opened his mouth again, then closed it again. What would have been, come out would have been, would have sounded wrong, wrong and cruel. Judd, I didn't go through all that just to kill the damn cat again. Judd drained his beer and then put it carefully aside with the other MPs. I guess that's it, he said. I'm, I am talked out. Can I ask you one, one other question, Lewis asked? I guess so, Judd said. Lewis said, has anyone ever buried a person up there? Judd's arm jerked convulsively. Two of the beer bottles fell off the table, and one of them shouted, Christ on his throne, said Lewis. No, and whoever would, you don't even want to talk about such things, Lewis. I was just curious, Lewis said uneasily. Some things it don't pay to be curious about, Judd Crandall said. And for the first time, he looked really old and firm, Lewis Creed, as if he was standing somewhere in the neighborhood of his own freshly prepared grave. And later at home, something else occurred to him about how Judd had looked that moment. He had looked like he was lying. End of chapter 26. We're going to stop there. It's a pretty long video today. But in the next video, we will get into chapter 27. And that's a short chapter because we'll read a bunch of them after that. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like, subscribe, comment below, hit that notification bell. Stay tuned for more from me. Our new kitty Bella, Chloe, Lily, and Jamie. Have a great night.